If you were a goth in 1999, you may have been listening to Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, or perhaps Susie and the Banshees. And if you were a goth here in Portsmouth in 1999, your gothic clothing would have been banned. This was in the wake of the Columbine Massacre. And yes, considering all the things that we might have done in the wake of Columbine, we banned gothic dress. I was assistant superintendent at that time, and a young woman called my office, and she represented herself as a spokesperson for the gothic community. I didn't know that we had a gothic community, <laughs> but we did. And she very politely explained to me that goths do not condone violence, but they do look on the dark side of things. At the time, I could only assure her that looking on the dark side of things would not be a violation of policy. During that period of time, I was meeting with a group of students at Portsmouth High School that I thought of as my kitchen cabinet. And on one occasion, I shared with them my discomfort with the language that I encountered in the foyer of the school at lunchtime. The language was not only vulgar, but at times degrading, including racial and gender slurs. Now, I know that the language didn't mean precisely the same thing to cabinet members as it did to me. But it was unnerving. So we talked about it, and we entered into dialogue about what we could do about this. We agreed that our purpose was not to eliminate offensive language in the foyer. Our purpose was instead to find a way to help students exercise greater discretion and greater self-control. With the help of a psychology class, we deployed student researchers into the foyer with counters, clickers, that they concealed in their pockets. And they proceeded to measure the frequency of degrading language in the foyer. At a subsequent meeting of the cabinet, I asked the students, what would happen if your grandparents walked through the foyer at lunchtime? There was an audible gasp, and that was the conception of the grandparents' civil air patrol. <laughs> we issued a citywide call for individuals that liked kids and had experienced World War II, the Great Depression, or Jim Crow. <laughs> and nearly a dozen showed up. There was Jean, and Jean was the vice president of the NAACP. He had been a CB in Korea, and he was an ultralight pilot. There was Mary. Mary had been a nurse with the British forces in India and Italy during World War II. She had also survived the Blitz of London. There was Paul. Paul had been a combat pilot in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And there was Jean. And Jean was the house manager of the Seacoast Repertory Theater. We advised the grandparents that they were not there to be disciplinarians. In fact, they didn't have to do anything. Just walk around. <laughs> and if conversations ensued, great. 
If not, just hang out. <laughs> well, a lot of great conversations did ensue. And yes, our researchers were there all the while counting the frequency of degrading language. And the frequency dropped precipitously. Notice, the change in behavior involved no punishment, no reward. No punishment, no reward, just grandparents. <laughs> Policy. Policy is simply a desired course of action. There are policies that are capital P policies, and these are the ones that we put in the district policy manual, and then we put the manual on the shelf. Then there are small P policies, and these are the policies that are unwritten, largely unspoken, but enacted in the classrooms, the hallways, the cafeterias, the playgrounds, the school buses. These are policies from the ground up, and they constitute the school's culture. Students will always be involved in the development of small p policies. You cannot stop them. This is where they live. The question is, how can we help students examine these policies and develop the skills for self-governance? Not for some so-called real world in the future, but for now. As John Dewey said, school is not preparation for life. School is life. And we have not scratched the surface of empowering students to self-govern. Why? Because we fear the loss of control. But there will be no high school reform until students are fully engaged in the governance of their school. Yes, there must be limits to student power. I understand that. But I would remind us all that the very constitution of this country is based upon a negotiated power-sharing agreement. We know something about how to do this. There is a mind-numbing sameness to our schools across this nation. Our schools must be allowed to develop their own unique living cultures. This is where new learning takes place, and no one can do it for them. As Van Morrison put it, no guru, no method, no teacher, just you and I in the garden. Thank you.